Okay, we are, I think I first need to apologize profusely to everybody. This was a rather long, um, closed session. I think we had lots of good conversation and lots of questions. So in that left you sitting and waiting for 15 minutes. So I want to apologize to everyone who's sitting out there waiting. Um, being late is not one of our specialties often. So with that said, I would like to open the open session of Benicia Unified School District for October 18th. And if everybody will please. Hold on. We need to report. Oh, we need to report out in closed session. Thank you. So the first thing I need to do is we discussed a student matter in closed session, and we need to report out on the findings. Thank you. So in the matter of student number 19-001, stipulated expulsion, do you support the recommendation of the committee? Do I and have a motion? We have a motion to that. So we're going to okay. need to add the motion first before we actually take a vote. Yes. OK. Do we have a motion? Make yes. A motion. I make a motion that we amend the stipulated agreement to conclude at the end of this semester in December of 2018. Do I have a second? I'll second that. And um, roll call vote, President Ferrucci? Yes. Trustee Holguin? Yes. Trustee Wing? Yes. Trustee Monette? Yes. Trustee Morgan? Yeah. Thank you. Now, now you can now I can go forward. Yes. Thank now you, Mr. Wing. Okay, and with that, I'm going to ask everybody to please join us in the pledge. And our highlight this evening is our County Superintendent of School, Ms. Lizette Estrella Henderson. Would you please lead us in the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Please be seated. Okay, so let's start with a motion to approve the agenda as written. So move. Do I have a second? second? All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? So the agenda passes. Thank you. All right, Dr. Young, we have a highlight this evening. Yes, well, uh, you kind of teed that up for us. Appreciate that. So we'd like to welcome. Uh, our County Superintendent, Lizette Estrella Henderson, to share a few words with us. Welcome, welcome. Glad you're here. Good to see you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. You are trustees welcome. Trustees and Superintendent Young. Um, it really is an honor and a pleasure to be here. And uh, this year, I started something new. I decided I would uh, come to each of our school district governing boards and welcome you back to school, <laughs> even though I, if I counted correctly, I have 63 or 64 days that you've already been in session. So um, so I will ask forgiveness for uh, getting here in October, but between all of the different school district board meetings, um, I'm finally here in Benicia Unified School District, and it really is an honor and a pleasure to be here. Um, so my purpose tonight, I won't take up too much of your time, but my purpose tonight is to welcome uh, everyone back to school and to talk a little bit about relationships. And relationships are so critically important to the work that we do together on behalf of the children that we serve in our communities. And um, Certainly, uh, your job as governing board uh, trustees is a huge one. It's a huge responsibility. And I just so appreciate that you take it so seriously, that you're reflective and thoughtful um, in your work and um, in the decisions that you make on behalf of the children, in this case, of the Benicia community. So um, thank you for that. And I also recognize that it takes relationships with your staff, with your superintendent, and also relationships with the county superintendent of schools and the county office of education. So you're probably wondering, where am I going with this? So um, uh, Solano County Office of Education has a long tradition of uh, positive relationships with the staff at uh, Benicia Unified School District. So critically important to the work that we do. Um, on behalf of all children and the work that we do to support Benicia Unified School District. So I thought I'd just take a little bit of time to share um, some of those endeavors and how we partner. 
So um, Benicia Unified School District staff, and in particular, Ms. Leslie Beetson um, and Mr. Timothy Ray Hill, um, have been participating in the local control accountability plan and local control um, uh, funding formula, technical assistance and support um, uh, network and collaborative network, where they have the opportunity to meet with their colleagues across the county. And uh, from the very beginning, uh, Tim was participating in that endeavor and now Leslie. And it's a real opportunity to problem solve around the LCFF and the Local Control Accountability Plan. And how do we make sense of, of those two um, endeavors, again, on behalf of the children of, of Benicia? So that's one way that we bring folks together and Benicia actively participates in that endeavor. Uh, we also offer a range of professional development learning opportunities that Benicia educators both um, classified, certificated administrators uh, participate in. And uh, for example, the um, Next Generation Science Standards, um, the Math and Science Grants um, that we have um, that we have gotten from the California County Superintendent's um, Educational Service Agency, work in the English Language Arts and ELD Content Standards. Um, we have folks that participate in the English Learner Consortium. Most recently, you, um, uh, universal design for learning and uh, ongoing instructional coaching. Those are just a few of the endeavors that um, your amazing staff participate in. And you've got um, wonderful educators in all of your schools that are doing great work on behalf of the children that they serve. And our role is to support those endeavors. Um, we also support the district's endeavors with foster and homeless youth, including case management, um, referrals for services, um, distributing through your staff, dental kits, school supplies provided through our partnerships with um, a variety of community-based organizations and faith-based organizations, um, in addition to grant funding. We also uh, work collaboratively with the district to address the needs um, of moderate to that, of students that have moderate to severe um, intellectual disabilities uh, with a class at Mary Farmer um, Elementary School and a class at Benicia Middle School, and also um, for students that are transitioning to adulthood uh, through the program at the Benicia Bridge. Um, and uh, we're very, uh, very supportive of your endeavors on behalf of every child, regardless of what their challenges are. We also um, are engaged in supporting your endeavors around career technical education, um, also providing support uh, in professional development around trauma-informed practices and uh, resiliency, not only for uh, your students, but also for staff and self-care and how critically important that is. Because this is really hard work. Um, and so it's important to remember everyone in the school community. Also uh, providing uh, support to you in your endeavors to combat um, uh, commercially sexually exploited children and um, human trafficking. And um, it, it's present in all of our communities. So how do we combat that? How do we come together, the school community, with your police, with health and social services, um, and uh, really looking at, you know, what are we doing to bring awareness um, to this issue? And then how do we uh, work with our youth um, to help combat that? Also, positive behavior interventions and supports in your schools are very engaged in PBIS and um, our model schools uh, in that arena. And we're, we're just so proud of the, the work that you've done and so proud to be partnering with you in that endeavors with a, a number of cohorts now of schools who have gone through that. Also, um, suicide prevention um, and working with your student services and also uh, training and applied suicide um, intervention skills training, assist um, uh, training provided to your school staff and um, supporting you in your endeavor um, to uh, develop your countywide um, as in addition to your school district um, suicide prevention plan, but 
how does that then feed into the countywide endeavors? Um, and uh, so those are just a few of the things, to name a few. And uh, we're just uh, so um, pleased to be partnering with you in your endeavors. Um, you care so much for the children of your community. And, um, you know, I see our role, three guiding principles, leadership, collaboration, and support on behalf of your endeavors to support the children of Venetia Unified School District. So welcome back to school, 63, 64 days in, and uh, we look forward to our ongoing relationship in supporting you. So thank, thank you. you so much. You. So I think also something to share just at this moment before you, because I believe you're probably going to leave quickly, is um, this was the second year in a row that we've had the pleasure of attending the county state of the county breakfast and we got to go through um, all of the things that were going on again in depth and listening to each district and how they're implementing those things and I just want to share that it's fabulous and it's very exciting. I, I'm hearing it with a different lens now. And um, it's been really kind of fun because I'll share in a little bit some of the contacts that I was able to make. So hopefully we can bring some new and exciting things to Benicia as well. So, But I just want to say thank you for the opportunity and hosting us again. It was a phenomenal event. So oh, wonderful. I'm so pleased. And we plan to continue to make that an annual event. It's a we had um, close to, I want to say, close to 90 individuals that included elected officials and community leaders that, that are all wrapping themselves around the children of our community. Mm -hmm. So um, thank you so much for that feedback. Appreciate it. Thank you. Whoops, with that said, we're going to move into reports. Um, we have our student reports coming up first. Sounds wired up. All right. Hello, everybody. My name is Ashlyn Smith. I am Venetia High School's ASB Vice President this year, and I just wanted to report on a couple of our current events. Last week was Venetia High School's Homecoming Week. Themed cinema each day was uh, themed a different genre of movie. Monday was Lights, Camera, Action. Tuesday was Pixar Fest. Wednesday was Wild Wild West. Thursday was Oldies But Goodies. And Friday was Blue and Gold. Also last week was our second annual homecoming carnival, which had a really great turnout. On Friday was our homecoming game and rally. During halftime at our homecoming game, Nayeli Barrera and Brandon Ferrer were crowned homecoming king and queen. Saturday was the homecoming dance. And tomorrow is our last home football game of the season. It is also football and cheer senior night. Other senior nights this week have included volleyball and tennis. Next week is Red Ribbon Week, and finally today, nominations came out for Senior Hall of Fame. I just want to commend the high school for doing a great job with the Spirit Week, and also really um, building the Spirit Week around the new traditions of the high school. I heard it was very well attended, and I heard lots of good response from the students. So thank you so much for doing that work. <laughs> Hi, I'm Piper Dean from Liberty High School, and this is what's been going on at our school. Mr. Pound took his English drama class to see the play Sweat in San Francisco at the American Conservat Conservatory Theater. Our art club went on a field trip with Arts Benicia to a gallery and to Lumin Luminance Skin Care, where the students received a free gift of skin care products. Liberty High School will also be having our first annual Oktoberfest Friday, October 26th with barbecue and field activities with competitions between our advisory classes. Students will also be presenting our Who Am I projects for the internship program. And finally, Liber Liberty High School would like to thank Venetia High School for the homecoming dance. Those who went really enjoyed it. Thank you. Okay, so um, students, you may leave. You. I'm sure you've got homework to get to, right? <laughs> sure. <laughs> Thank you very much, ladies. You did a great job. Okay, and we will turn over to Dr. Young for the superintendent's report. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome, everybody. Welcome aboard. I had a few items to go over. I wanted a, a, a real quick uh, headline to share with you that there's an organization called the Niche Organization, and they have a 
um, uh, criteria that they use to rank schools throughout the state of California. And uh, we do pretty well with that typically. And uh, the headline is Benicia Unified ranked best school district in Solano County. Uh, and then they break it down into a number of, of categories uh, called college prep, et cetera, et cetera. So proud of proud of that one organization. It's not a perfect analysis, but uh, we'll, we'll take we'll take the recognition. Like <laughs> um, a few things. I've started my coffee chats out at the school sites with parents, and I've uh, already met a farmer, Matthew Turner. Um, another notable event we had a tr uh, really in depth training with all of the um, administrative team, and I think we had at least one teacher there on the new evaluation system that was uh, ratified during negotiations called the Danielson model. And we had a presenter, somebody that Dr. Beetson is a colleague of hers that we were able to work with, and it was outstanding. So we look forward to implementation of that new um, system. Uh, we also had the District Facility Steering Committee. We met on October 10th, and we went over you know, where we are with all of the Vaughn projects uh, and what's coming next. The, the big one is the middle school, making great progress with that. And then I think at the November 1st board meeting, uh, Ms. Egan will come and give us more detail into, into that project. She has some pictures for you. And I think Lee Pollard from HY Architects will come in and join us. Uh, I had a, a, a first of what will be many meetings uh, with the, the BTA site union reps. So each school site has a number of reps. I think it's two at the elementary, three at the middle, four at the high school, one at Liberty. And uh, they, they take on the role of being representatives at, at the school site. So I thought it would be a nice idea for me to make myself available to that group to meet monthly. We were, I was suggested maybe we meet every other month, and so we want to meet every month. So uh, it was a good meeting. We were able to talk about a number of um, uh, interesting items and issues, and the intent of that is to um, you know, continue to build trust throughout the system and, and, to, and to strengthen relationships between management and, uh, and all the staff. So I was very, very pleased with that meeting. Uh, we, uh, Dr. Gill and I went to a workshop yesterday with uh, North Bay Insurance Group, and it was terrific. And the title of it was Engaging Your School Community in a Changing World. And the presenter there, uh, Sean Casey, it was terrific. And he spent the day with him talking about communication strategies, you know, branding, marketing, communicating in times of crisis. So that was outstanding. We're happy that we went to that. Uh, I think everybody knows that uh, today was the the uh, Great American Shakeout. Our schools participated in that. And just to tee up Dr. Beetson's presentation very quickly that she, um, we'll do more analysis on this, but kind of this first look, we had the, on the SBAC scores, we had three students at the high school uh, that got every single question correct. Uh, and so there was, oh, there was 10 in English. 10 in English. Okay, 10, 10 in English, three in math, we can we can post the names later, but that's a, a, a terrific terrific achievement. So, um, with the students taking that seriously, and then Dr. Beetson will have more analysis on that when she gets into her presentation. So that's it from your superintendent. That's awesome. That's great news to hear. Okay, now we're going to move on to board reports. We start at Mr. Morgan's end. Okay, Ms. Manay, your report list. <laughs> Okay, Mr. Wing, what about you? I'll see. What did we do? We facility meeting was really good. Um, excited to hear about the upcoming um, progress or upcoming events that's going to happen at the middle school, which would be a next week, next month meeting, or our next meeting. So I'm excited for all that. Um, homecoming was just all last week at the high school, and and included Liberty was was outstanding. Um, well attended. The carnival was well attended. The um, the homecoming, the football game, the, um, and then the dance itself. We had um, the largest crowd I've had to chaperone in a while. A little over a thousand students showed up. <laughs> so and then there was no problem. So it was we. I think last year was nine thirty, and we had thousand fourteen this year. Wow. So. Um, and everybody was well respected, and I mean, it was, it was, it seemed like they had a great time. So, there is some upcoming events that our elementary schools is having that we sometimes we don't bring out of this meeting, but we will for this one. Henderson, October 20th, is having their county fair that's this coming Sunday or Saturday. Um, the 26th are having a Halloween family dance. 
And then Robert Semple's having their Har Harvest Festival October 27th. And then the others are just doing stuff. It's not on their calendar. I haven't seen emails, and they're just doing stuff during the day, during the school day. So that's all I have. Oh, I do have one other. I brought it up a little bit earlier um, in our meeting there is that Benicia Youth Action Coalition, that's one of the committees I sit on for many years. Um, with all the issues with vaping and everything, we're, we received some grant money from tobacco um, tax fund, however it came through, but we're, we're, having, we're going to get, get a trailer made. Um, a couple of our reps just got back from Iowa for their narcotics um, um, officers uh, event and saw their trailer. And, it's, you know, what did I miss? It's going to be education for parents. And the trailer will be set up as a, a teenager's bedroom. And they'll have the opportunity to walk through and look for stuff. And then we'll show them all the, um, all the stuff that they actually missed that involves drugs and alcohol and, and vaping and cigarettes. And with the invention of uh, vaping and all the little things, this right here could be a vapor. I mean, it's, it's, so we just want to educate parents as well and make sure that they're all educated and know what could be possibilities for their students. So that is coming up probably be the first of the year by the time we get the trailer actually custom made and, and brought to Benicia. So that's that. So thank you. Thank you. Dr. Holman. Um, I just follow up on the homecoming. I really enjoyed the, the atmosphere of the whole homecoming week. and. You know, particularly since a couple of years ago, there was some concerns by the students about things that were changing. And so to see it be so full and so engaging and everything, I think, is just very positive that we're going in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, I did a little running around as well this past week or so. As I said, we went to the state of the county, which was um, exciting, and it kind of triggered the next two events that I'm going to share with you because one of the things that um, I've been trying to get a little more information about is this Project Inspire that is going on right now in the northern part of the county. And I've been like, well, what about Benicia? I know we're little, but what about Benicia? So um, we got I got to get up to the program. I ended up being the CSBA rep, had to do an evaluation because they signed up for a Golden Bell project. So I had to go in as their evaluator. So I got to spend the day and go through. So what Project Inspire, in, Inspire is, is the seventh and eighth grade, your students do the Naviance and they kind of get their job tendencies or interests. And this is their first opportunity as eighth graders to be exposed to all of the jobs in Solano County, which I have to tell you, I was floored. I didn't know all these things happened in Solano County. I was quite impressed myself. And then once they come back as 10th graders, they're actually getting out to the businesses. And then the hope is that in 12th grade, the students might earn an opportunity for an apprenticeship or an internship, or maybe just have, or a job hire, depending on what their path is. So it's really looking at, you know, we talk about 21st century skills and having our students be career ready. This is really that piece that gives them something a little more tangible for career ready, because now they've, they've got something to talk about. And it makes schooling a little more meaningful for a lot of our students. So anyways, that's the project. Um, I've been talking with the folks a lot. I've been sharing it with Dr. Young, and one of the steps we need to do is to um, get out and visit with our chamber. So I'm in contact with Stephanie, and I'll get there soon to get some information for us. The other project that came about is, and I need to thank Mr. Morgan, because he sent me off to Valero for him because he was unable to make an early meeting that day. Valero has what they call the CAP, is that, and I forget what it stands for. Thank you. Um, so I got to sit in for Peter on this meeting because it happened to be a 3.30 in the afternoon meeting, which was, was difficult for him. And of course, they demonstrated their new monitoring system, which they're putting out. It was a requirement by the city that it be done by December. So that was there. But one of the things that also I found out is um, Paul Adler had gone to the county meeting. So by the time I got to the Valero meeting, he informed us that he that Valero wants to sponsor the eighth grade girls STEM project to get them to camp at UC Davis this year. So 
I've um, been playing phone tag with a couple of folks at the county to find out what the cost is, because what I told them is probably would be nice to have a dollar amount. Mm -hmm. So, um, but they will be funding our, our team and then have the opportunity to do that. So it was, it was a very productive, I thought, good week. So I want to thank Peter for making me go in his place, because it actually uh -huh. ended up uh -huh. benefiting our kids in a, in a fabulous way. So I was quite excited about that. Um, the other things that I did this week is, you know, every week I walk site. So I walked Benicia High School. And again, I was very excited because you know how we have our Panther TV, which is amazing. Thank you, Matt O'Reilly. Um, he is he's kind of mentoring our eighth grade teacher, our new eighth grade teacher. So when I was there, our eighth graders were on the high school campus and they were being mentored by the Panther TV team. And they're kind of taking them through to get them set up. So you know, the conversation that I had with um, Ms. Kleinschmidt was, wow, these kids are going to be primed and ready by the time they get to high school. Matt's going to really be able to take off with his team. So what a great opportunity for collaboration to be happening between not just the teachers of the schools, but the students and the teachers at the school. So I was really thrilled about that. And then, of course, we went to the facility meeting. So that was pretty exciting. And we talked a little bit about Mary Farmer as well. And then today I walked Mary Farmer. So, oh, yes, you know, that absolutely is a school that we need to be talking about real quickly. And then, <laughs> and then I did policies, which you're going to get your first read today. I know you've already done that. But, you know, again, just a reminder that the board reviews policy all the time because um, state law continually changes. Our legislature is very active in passing regulations that impact schools and our board policy is the way that we respond to those changes in the law and what it's going to look like in our school district so i was tired this week okay <laughs> it was a lot but it was a good week it was really a good week so okay my bill will come later <laughs> Okay, so now it's time to hear from the public. So just a reminder, members of the public may address the board at a regular meeting on any item within the board's jurisdiction. Cards may be completed requesting to address the board. They're available at the back table and may be submitted to the board secretary at the meeting. The governing board allows speakers to speak at regular meetings on agendized and non-agendized matters under public comment. Comments are limited to no more than three minutes per speaker. By law, no action may be taken on any item raised during public comment periods, and matters may be referred to staff for placement on a future agenda of the Governing Board. And we have a speaker, JoJo. Please come forward. Thank you, JoJo Donetti, Benicia Community Tennis. Uh, just letting you know that tonight the girls' tennis team at Benicia High finished their season. Uh, with an 8-1 victory over Ignacio Valley. So we finished our season undefeated again. again. Wow. wow. Yay. So this is our sixth year in a row that we will get the league championship, and that's extended our undefeated record to 85-0. and 0. So of the 108 individual matches we played this season, we only lost 12. So that's pretty good. Wow. That's yeah. amazing. It's not yeah. pretty good. Yeah, it's a great, great team. And we had some adversity this year. One of the girls tore her ACL while playing soccer. So we had to bump a couple of JV up. And, uh, you know, with illnesses and whatnot, the, the team really dug in deep. And uh, they, they pulled it through. So that's great. We enjoyed playing that league over uh, across the bridge. Um, the girls were all excellent sportsmen. They um, showed showed great talent uh, from the other teams, and they were all very good sportsmen. Uh, their coaches were as well, so this was a good move for us. Um, what we also noticed with the new league is the tennis courts. Concord High had their courts resurfaced, completely renovated this year. They're beautiful. Alhambra had theirs redone last year. And Northgate, although they're technically not part of our conference, we did have a friendly game against them. Theirs just finished this year as well with new fencing and new gates. Uh, so in taking a look at the other five schools that are in our conference, we are officially the worst. I thought Ignacio Valley might be the worst when we played them today because they had just as many cracks as we did. But because we've got that hump on court five and that gash on court six, we are officially the worst. 
So I uh, would very much appreciate you taking that Measure S funding that was allocated for them and getting those courts fixed so that uh, we can pump up our reputation a little bit. So thank you. Thank you. Are there any other speakers? That's the only one. Thank you. OK, so we're going to move on to the consent calendar. We're going to, I'm going to call for a motion to approve the consent calendar as presented. All matters listed under the consent calendar are considered by the board to be routine and will be approved by the board in one motion. There will be no discussion on these items unless members of the board, staff, or public request specific items to be pulled or discussed. Do I have any comments? Uh, Can I have a motion? Sure. Um, I move that we approve the consent calendar as presented. I need to do a roll call. Second. Though. Thank you. President Frucci? Yes. Trustee Holguin? Yes. Trustee Wing? Yes. Trustee Monette? Yeah. Trustee Morgan? Yeah. Thank you. And that's because of resolution 18 19 22. Correct. Okay, so we are up to discussion items, which is um, section 12. Um, our board policies, correct? I kind of, my, my computer went off and on, so I kind of lost my spot. Okay, this is our first reading of the board policies. Um, some of them refer to um, the school, some of them to refer to our English learners, and some of them are our board policies for us. So are there any questions or comments on these? I did have a question on the education travel program contracts. Mm -hmm. And just a clarification of terms, when we say travel program contracts, are these our, our field trip plans, or is this referencing actual contracts like district-wide contracts about how we make airplane travel or something? Mm -hmm. It's BPAR 3320. No, I'm sorry, 3312.2. These are um, the contracts for overnight out-of-state field trips. Our when we trip. contract with an organization. So we don't always contract with an organization, but when we do. Those, then those would now have to come to the board. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Are there any other questions on any of you? I, I do just thank you, Betty, and whoever put in time on this, is that you know when you go through and you give us the Word doc of what's changed and highlight the paragraph, mm -hmm. and it makes it so easy to to understand instead of reading the 2,000 pages, I could read two. So thank you. And one of the reasons some of these were brought forward this time and they do not have the track changes is because we're doing a federal program monitoring um, report and there's uh, they have recommended some updates on our policies and um, they're not recommended by CSBA necessarily. So that's why some of them ha do not have track changes this time. And just a reminder, it's federal. It's the federal monitoring that we're going through. OK, so if there's no other questions, we're going to go on to CASP 12.2. These back, these will come back at the next meeting for a vote. 12.2, the report and discussion on the CASP performance. Dr. Beetson. Excellent. Well, thank you, uh, trustees. I'm excited to be here and uh, talk with you about our CASP results this year. I always bring this in two waves. The first is our percentage increase, decrease on the CASP test, which if you remember is um, tested in English language arts for all students third through eighth grade and 11th grade. And then December or January, I bring back the dashboard, and that's the accountability measure. It's got the, the different color grid, so it's this, uh, many of the same data pieces in a different format. Tonight, however, um, I want to talk with you about um, the purpose of summative assessments. A CASP is a summative assessment. It's given at the end of the year. Um, let you know how we did and how we're going to use these results to continue to improve uh, our instructional program. Everything that we do is about uh, informing our teaching and our learning. And so we look at student performance, and one of the questions we ask is, what's our current state? How are we doing? What were the learning conditions? What was the environment like? What happened during that testing time? 
what practices, policies, and program may have impacted? What was going on at the time? What might be some con contributions to uh, how we performed? And then based on all of that analysis, what do we need to change or do next? One of the things that we um, uh, are reminded by, um, by Dr. Young always, is there are five factors or lenses that we need to continue to look at when we look at our data and we give the state assessment. And one is demographics. Another is um, the alignment of our assessments, teacher attitude towards the test, our testing environment conditions, and then do students have the opportunity to practice um, in like formats? So day to day, do they have opportunities to practice with um, uh, examples, tasks, questions that look similar to what they will experience so that it's not a cold run when they take the test? And we used those lenses and um, the questions, oh, look at this. I'm, uh, on the screen um, as we started to, to do our beginning analysis. This data was just released about a week ago, and so we haven't fully vetted it yet with all of the teachers, um, but we did have the opportunity to pull a small group of teachers on Monday um, and our admin council to do a first look through and talk with them about what they're seeing in the data and why that might be, and really reflecting on those questions. So just a reminder, um, the CASP, or the SBAC test, this is our fourth, uh, last year was our fourth year of administration. It replaced the old uh, California state test, the CST. I've already talked about the grades that it's administered in. It comes in lots of formats. Students have to do a multiple choice, short answer, constructed response, and performance task. A performance task on this uh, particular assessment um, may have the students read three or four articles, do some research, watch a short video, synthesize all of that uh, information, and then write um, an essay on it. So it's very involved and oftentimes over um, a couple of days. Another interesting thing about this assessment um, is that it's computer adaptive, which means it ramps up in its rigor. Um, which is a wonderful thing, and, and it will scale back because it wants to really assess where the students are performing at. That also contributes to um, a factor of what the teachers and uh, we have discussed is testing fatigue. So for instance, my own daughter said, well, I was working and I had three problems left and then all of a sudden I had 10 more. And so it goes on and on. And so there is a piece where it's very rigorous and long. And, and so it's a great piece to have in that assessment, but it's also um, can, can contribute to some exhaustion on the part of our students. The other piece that is um, particular to the SBAC is that it's built with something called universal design. And you heard our county superintendent mention that. And that's something that we're beginning to um, do some real training in. And basically, universal design uh, builds in many um, accommodations, if you will, that are open to everyone. And so if you want to change the font on the reading passage from white background and black text to black background and white text, or a yellow background because you read it better that way. You want to use a highlighter to help you track your reading. Lots of tools um, that anyone can use, and that's uh, universal design. You can change the font size. So different things like that. That's built right into this test, which is very different than the old CST. Do we train our students to use those tools? Well, that's one of the things that we have. We do, but maybe not enough. And we need to be doing them ongoing so that it's not just training for the test because these are great practices and so that's a, um, something that we're studying together for sure. It's also aligned to our Common Core State Standards of course and college and career readiness and so one of the things um, that I'll talk about a little bit more is really um, incentivizing our high school students, our 11th graders, um, to, to have this be a meaningful assessment and um, my understanding is that when a student who is in 11th grade can pass the um, CASP test with a three or better, they automatically don't need to be in a remedial uh, reading or uh, math class when they go to college. So that's um, a good thing. I think we need to promote that more because it, it gets them some skin in the game. Like, why should I bother with this assessment? And it's, like I said, very rigorous and has a lot of abstract reasoning. Um, so 
these are summative assessments. They're lag results. We don't get them until well after that. Um, uh, the students are out of those classes. But we look at how do we continually, continually improve our program. So that's the best use of what we can do with this, is, is look for trends over time, and then look at our program, look for alignment. Um, so it is about the numbers, but it's not only about the numbers. We need to analyze them. And then we also need to look at our student groups. Have we addressed the lag some at all? Because the big push with this test was supposed to be teachers were going to have these results in two weeks so that it was meaningful data yeah. that they can go back to their classrooms sure. and say, hey, OK, so I'm pipe dreaming. OK, no, And yeah. I think I, I don't know. My yeah. hypothesis is that it, it, it was more complex to get this amount of scoring back done well. If you remember, we have had to bump the presentation of this because it takes longer and longer for them to clean their data. And so it's just a massive um, undertaking. But it is, it's frustrating for sure. Um, I already went over. These are the guiding questions that we used as we did our initial data analysis. And I always call it the what, which is what are the facts in the data? It's the so what, what do we think it means? And then the now what, what are we going to do about it? And so we use those as lenses to look at our data. So I know there's a lot of words on this screen. I told Dr. Young I broke his cardinal rule of um, <laughs> PowerPoints. But I wanted to put enough explanation in there to, uh, you know, if you wanted to go back later and look at them. Um, so some, some celebrations in our data this year. Uh, we have, in our elementary cohorts, those are looking at the, the students as they take the test in third grade, those same students in fourth grade and fifth. And I will tell you, it's not a pure cohort. So it doesn't, we don't take out the move in and move out students, but those grade levels as a, uh, those students that move from grade to grade. Um, and we're showing some gradual increase at the elementary level, which is great. It's not as fast as we'd like it to go, but it's going in the direction that we want it to go. We also um, showed some increase um, in our seventh grade students, not the cohort, but seventh grade year to year from 2016 administration, 17 administration, and 18th administration. So that's um, exciting news. So, um, and um, this next one talks about that cohort again. So just from the first administration, our third grade students scored 49% as a district uh, proficient or um, exceeding the standard or meeting the standard, the new terminology, um, to 60% on this last administration. And so that's uh, a real testament to the hard work that our teachers are doing and giving students that, that practice time. The next three um, bullet points are those cohorts again. And what's exciting about this is Matthew Turner, Joe Henderson, and Mary Farmer, um, the third grade students, as when they took it again as fifth graders, um, really increased. So you can see Matthew Turner was 73% at fifth grade. When those students took it, they were 51% when they took it as third graders. Uh, Joe Henderson, 63 at fifth grade. When they took it as, as third graders, they're at 58%. So you can see some good growth there um, uh, in those cohorts. And then Robert Semple, a celebration is that there are students that performed at the level one, and that's the lowest level, over the last couple of years did decline. And so that's what we want to see. So they're starting to move up. Some celebrations in math. Um, we were uh, the top scoring district in Solano County um, for our math which is exciting. Math across the state has been a real conundrum of how to get students to move. And so we're not where we want to be by any means, but we uh, continue to stay at the top in Solano County. Um, another great celebration in math is that our English learner students increased by 10 percentage points um, from last year. So that's very exciting for us. And um, our seventh grade, again, uh, math increase year to year from 2016 to 18 has increased. Those next bullet points again talk about our elementary cohorts of third to fifth graders and some great improvements um, that you see. So there's two bullet points for each. One is the total of students meeting and exceeding. So for instance, that first bullet point, the Matthew Turner third graders were 50% met and exceeded and they moved to 61% when they got to fifth grade, same students. And the real bump is moving, the, the second bullet explains moving the students that met to exceeded. So we're getting more students moving from meeting to exceeding, which is really, really exciting. Um, 
And so that's what those, those extremes. So what's happening at the elementary, that programming that we put in place a few years ago with the new math program, the new workshop program is making gains, albeit not as quickly as we would hope, but it, we're getting there. Areas of concentration. Um, let me find my page. I will tell you that as a district, um, administrators and teachers, we're going to be continuing to study both areas of English language arts and math and, and continue to do some deep dives in alignment, going back to the standards, looking at what the standards are asking, looking at the curriculum maps, looking at the test items, and identifying where is our programming and instruction strong, where are our gaps, because we should be making... Um, for the, the hard work that everyone's doing, we should be moving faster than we're moving. And so we want to continue to look at that. Um, we still need to look at how do we close this achievement gap for our students in various student groups. One of the pieces that uh, teachers have identified is we need to build in some more math fact fluency and understanding of number sense at the elementary level. That doesn't mean going back to timed math tests because that actually can have a negative effect, but building in more practice time that looks, you know, playing dice games, playing card games, computer uh, games, and, and so forth. Um, another area that we're going to do a deep dive in is our students tend to have a significant decline as they move from elementary to middle, especially in the sixth grade year. And then we see it bump up again in the seventh grade year. So we're, we need to look at, is there a curricular uh, alignment that is missing? Is there something that we need to do differently? Another area um, across the board that we'll be looking at, um, because we're probably not doing enough, is listening. So on the assessment, there are listening tasks. So students actually put headphones in, they listen to a speech, they listen to a particular video, they have to take notes and they have to write uh, responses to and answer questions for. And we probably don't do enough tasks that look similar to that for kids to practice. The alignment of curriculum with the test, so matching up what we're doing, the kinds of tasks we are asking kids to do with what the test questions look like and their level of text complexity. And then vertically, so doing that vertical alignment as well. And then, um, and finally, analyzing the depth of knowledge. So are we asking the questions, it sort of goes with the one I was just talking about, as robustly and as complex as they're asked on this assessment. I think we have a tendency to peel things apart and maybe ask kids to do things in smaller chunks in the classroom, whereas they get to the test and they may um, cluster three or four layers of things that students need to do in one problem. And so kids miss it because we peel them apart for them in the classroom. The other piece that teachers have been talking about is workshop. If you could capture the depth and level of conversations that kids have around text and writing in the classroom, somehow it's not translating to when they actually do it independently. So there's this um, we focus a lot on working in groups and working in teams and having conversation and questioning and that argumentative dialogue, which is all 21st century skills, but then they go to the test and they do it individually and have to process it and they don't have that thought partner. And so we need to figure out a way to, to have them generalize and transfer what we know they know into that testing environment, if that makes sense. Can I uh, ask a question? Does, Absolutely. Does, does the state give you the functionality to compare the performance and improvements that you see in our district against other districts so that you can really look for the sensitivity of the, the data to know whether or not the movement you're seeing is something we're doing or is inherent in the test itself? And so what I'm wondering is like almost trend lines where if 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 you know that math is seventh grade math is increasing statewide mm -hmm. or countywide at a you know three percent year over since the last administration, are you above or below the norm in the state of improvement? And would it also allow you then to see if there are districts who have substantial increases in improvements at that? Would allow you to investigate. Well, what are they doing? Are there best practices going? Yes. On? Um, yes. You compare. You just look up different. Um, districts, different counties, and you can look at their scores and then compare how you're doing. And I was actually at um, an LCAP meeting today uh, that um, 
our county superintendent referenced and was talking to um, other assistant superintendents about how they're performing and what are they doing. And so we're going to continue to have those conversations. And we need to now look outside of our county as well yeah. um, and, and do that work. And we have, we've, we've gone, when we're thinking about our English learners, we have a very tiny population, but it's significant enough to make an impact. So um, we said we need to, and we have more newcomers, so students who are coming to us with no English, which is different in our demographic than it has been in the past. Um, yeah, that's the hard thing with, these, with this data, right? Because correlation doesn't mean causation. And, right. Uh, you have to look to see, okay, it's great that we had an improvement, but if everyone had a bigger improvement, right. then maybe we didn't have an improvement. Maybe it was just a test. Right. Right. And, and there are so many factors right. that impact that. It's, it's hard to draw the an exact line. The state doesn't like give you that dashboard and say, here's where you, where you as a district sat relative to the norm average in the state or... You, yeah, we can look up where we are to, to the norm. Mm -hmm. That would be helpful, I think, for people to know. Yeah, I just yeah. didn't know, but more trend, like year over year, you know, for each administration, can you see, are you, are you improving better than others or worse than others? I have that data. I don't know that I found it to be in like a scatter okay. plot like that. I look up, we look right, up you separate have to find districts. Yourself. Yeah. Um, it's, it could be out there and I just haven't uh, stumbled across it yet. So I have a bunch of uh, data slides in here. I'm not going to walk you through each one of them, but they're in a couple different formats that I wanted to just um, highlight a few things on here. And then if you have particular questions, um, and then the, I'll end with a bunch of items of uh, that are our next steps, our now what's. So I have an ELA slide and then later on in the presentation a math slide that looks like this. And this is, um, Mr. Morgan, what you were talking about is how are we ranking over time? And this is comparative to our county. Um, I can certainly look up other, uh, I, I, Martinez is on my list to look up because they're similar to us. Um, in terms of demographic and size and so forth. And so um, we are, uh, we have declined over the, the years. As a district, we have pockets that are increasing, pockets that are stagnant, and some that are declining. And so we're investigating that. This uh, particular slide is just by grade level. How did our students do from 2015, 16, um, for 2017 and 18, I left um, how they did at each performance level as well. And then what our change was over time. You can also look at this on the diagonal and see cohort trends. And so this is where you can look at in 2017, our third graders um, met or exceeded 54% of them met or exceeded. And then when they moved to fourth grade, 56% of them met or exceeded. And then fourth grade to fifth grade was 57 to 62. And then you can see our decline, fifth grade to sixth grade, 61% in fifth grade to 44%. And so that's happening in both English and math, and we're trying to figure out what's, what's happening because we know those sixth grade teachers are working their tails off um, doing the work. And so what is it that is um, creating this? Do the fifth and sixth grade teachers have an opportunity to I know you do lots of collaboration, but right. do they have an opportunity to we have together to see? We have done some, but not enough, but not enough. Because that's also where the standards change again, right? right. It's, it's the sixth grade is it? Mm -hmm. um, so that's one of the charts. Then there are many charts that look like this, and these are our cohort uh, charts. So this was just all of our third through fifth graders, excuse me, in ELA. And then I have it by school, English language arts. And then we look at our subgroups. And I added a couple more subgroups on here that were significantly below our performance of all. Um, and so we are particularly concerned about our Hispanic Latino population and our Black and African American population because we are not making progress with them. And so that's one of the pieces that we've embarked on too, is looking at culturally responsive uh, practices, universal design for learning, and figuring out what do we need to do differently so that all students start at the same starting line and then we continue to support them throughout. And so we've started that work. That might be one area where it could be getting Central growth. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Um, and then I just, whoops. 
there we go. And then just a, um, a plot graph of those uh, performances of those student groups. And then the same thing happens, whoops, wrong direction. There you go. And then uh, for math as well. So um, we are well above the state in math. We have, uh, we declined two, two points from last year. We're still top performing in the county, but not where we want to be. And then the same types of um, grade level and um, cohort data throughout. So I'm happy to spend time on any particular slide if you want. Um, the other area that we're looking at is 11th grade because what has happened with 11th grade is um, they score high one year and the next year low and then high and low. And part of it is student motivation. You know, we've switched around. We do the AP test first and then the CASP test and then the SAT. So they're all kind of clustered right in that time frame. And so they've played around with different testing, win excuse me, testing windows. Um, and the conversation that we're having at the high school that we're beginning, and I, I, not everybody's been able to be involved in this yet, but how do we incentivize kids and make this something that they want to work for? You just want to test the math out of it. Yes. And we, um, <laughs> you have to have 95% participation. So you get dinged if you don't. That was a, um, a big issue a year ago in the middle school. Many, many students were opting out. And um, we were just at our threshold of 95% participation. Um, so you can opt out of, of the assessment, but it does hurt us um, as a district. So what about their, the level <coughs> of courses, Leslie? Is it still so accurate that they need to be, I'm sorry, is it still accurate, the level of math classes? Is it still accurate that they need to be at the integrated level three? So that was another piece you're going to see in these last okay. slides. Um, some of the correlation that the math department is beginning to do is to align student performance on this assessment their grades and their level of math that they've taken at um, the high school. So currently we have a two-year math requirement, but you only have to go through integrated one. This test assesses the standards through integrated three. Mm -hmm. And so we're starting, they're doing that mapping now of, you know, if students finish math in 10th grade, they don't even have math their 11th grade year. Mm -hmm. Or their take, if they have struggled in math, they may still be trying to pass integrated one in their 11th grade year. So they haven't gotten far enough down that math road yet. Um, so we're looking at that. That's part of the, um, when we met with teachers, they went back and said, we've got to figure this out. We need to figure out what, what stand, they're even mapping down to the standards. They've taken the questions and the blueprints and said, okay, where is this in our program? At what level math do kids get these types of questions? Um, so that is one uh, major factor. So this, this slide came uh, from input from teachers and administrators. Not excuses, but what are some potential impacts? Um, testing fatigue, as I said, the test one is either because they've just finished AP and SATs and now they're on to this one, or that the test ramps up and the kids can take a very long time because the test grows as you do well on the test. Um, Relevancy, motivation, and scheduling, test anxiety, um, teaching that transfer. So I can do it in the classroom, but it's not transferring over to the test. Testing mindset, I think, and that's both on the part of staff and students and parents. Um, training with and fidelity to our programs and looking at that. The access uh, access to and use of technology. So do are we... Um, equitable in that? Are we giving kids the right kinds of practice on that? Relationships, um, competing tests I talked about already, and looking at the high school math graduation requirements in comparison and levels of math that kids are taking. Um, that re reflects on a question I had is that uh, now for college access, students should be completing integrated two, correct? Uh, I, yes, for A through G, it would yeah, be through integrated two. Correct. The state still has a two-year math requirement. Mm -hmm. um, so those are out of alignment with the A to G. 
And BUSD only has the two year math mm -hmm. requirement. Through integrated, Through integrated one. one. Two so years some kids have could to take complete integrated, integrated one, one. And then personal finance. Right. But by stopping there, they are not eligible for completing their A through G requirements right. for the CSU, for the UC, or privates. Right. Um, so I've got two slides. I'm not going to read all of these, but one, these. One, one question. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. You got a question? C come up with the podium real fast. <laughs> Since we're right here at this stage for discussion, right? In the microphone, huh? Sorry. Uh, in the beginning, when you guys said uh, there's like a time for discussion, and then uh, they talked about the tennis courts, was like that? Was that like the only time we could have talked, or like? Because I. For public comment. Yeah. For public comment, yes. Okay, it was kind of quick. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh. Did we? Yeah, just come up and tell us what you. Since you had the since you had the courage to come up and do it, we'll let, we'll let you. We're gonna uh, yep, let you go. We're gonna break procedure and give you an opportunity to share your thoughts. Okay. So like three minutes. Ten, ten, <laughs> in, ten when, times up. Go. <laughs> when you guys were talking about the Naviance thing in uh, eighth grade when it's like starting, I think that's pretty cool. Like cool because. I don't know anybody that's ever looked at their Naviance since like ninth grade, since we like set them up. So, I mean, like, good that you're starting it off early, because uh, I don't even look at mine, and like the library's not open, and I don't really know how to access it. So, yeah, that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry about that. That's quite all right. Okay. <laughs> I've got two slides of actions moving forward, and these are beginnings of our the now what's conversations with uh, small groups of teachers and our administrators. But this conversation is going to be continuing to spill out at the sites and in department meetings um, and DCC. So if you're coming next week to DCC, we'll probably do this um, conversation as well. So just a couple things I wanted to highlight on these lists. Um, one is we've started a discussion about the need to pull together a TK to 12 literacy team and a math team of teachers with representation from primary, elementary, intermediate, elementary, middle, high school um, to really pull again, pull out the standards. There are these things called blueprints that will tell you there are this many types of questions on the test in these standards and so forth. And so matching those to our curriculum, excuse me, and doing some deep looking about, are we asking questions that, you know, the things I've been talking about, are we um, in alignment? And then making some recommendations to us. Um, we are looking, we've already identified some um, gaps. So we are investigating and working with our county on um, ramping up our support for English learners. And as I said, we have a very small population, but what do we need to do within the classroom experience for those students? Phonics and grammar instruction. We talked about math, uh, the level of math taking by high school students, and how does that align with the assessment? The aligning of instructional practices with the test, so making sure that we ask questions and give kids tasks that look like what's on the test. And then relevancy. Um, so a great conversation happened with our administrators um, where uh, June Regis, who is our um, coordinator for our uh, early childhood and adult ed programs, was meeting with Kim Lewis, our principal at Liberty High School. And so um, relevancy is a real factor for why is this test important. And so they're going to partner their math instructor for the trades for adult ed and see if he'll come in and do some small group work in at Liberty High School to show that relevance, start getting that hook in early. So that was a great conversation. You know, something um, else you mentioned earlier too about these ca the CAST tests and the relevancy to students taking them now is because the colleges have eliminated the placement exams for math and English, mm -hmm. the outcomes of these tests can determine their placements in college. Right. right. And we and need so to we, we need to tell them that. So that I, you know, and I talked <laughs> yeah. with um, with Ms. Kleinsmith about that, and she said they do. They put it in their newsletter. They talk about it. But we've got to promote that more. Mm -hmm. I think, um, for sure. Uh, can I? Um, 
sure to ask this, but the, the, the when, I, when I was hearing you say relevancy, I was thinking, what's the relevancy of this score, right? What, what, so in other words, what's it predictive of and why, why put so much effort behind it? If it's predicting the success of our students, the success of the school, does it correlate with graduation rates, with, with college attendance, with career readiness? I mean, in other words, are we just chasing a number the state gives us? Are we trying to test to teach to the test? Or do we, is there a common understanding within the district of why this is, score is even important? I think there's an understanding. I don't know if everyone has the belief. Yeah. Um, there's multiple answers to that that question. One is it is summative. And so it should show us, did we do a great job of teaching our standards and having kids master the standards that the state has put out that says learning should look like this by the end of fifth grade and seventh grade and, and so on. Um, it's an accountability tool. And so... Could you correlate, I mean, I don't know if you get the scores down to the student level. I think. Yes, we do. So could you correlate a score to a grade point average? And are they predictive? That's a good question. They should be. That, um, so, and it's not on this list, but I am taking a team in May to talk about grading because that's. Um, yeah, and, and could you correlate a student, say they were in Benicia Unified, the whole, you know, kindergarten to high school. Mm -hmm. Could you correlate their performance on these tests against SAT scores and college? We should be able to. They should show, and we have done some when students, well, actually we did it in reverse. When students were performing at a particular reading level in elementary school, we could find what reading level do they need to be at on our local uh, curriculum and local assessments to score on this assessment. And so we need to keep looking at, are our grading practices aligned? And right now, I'll tell you, they probably aren't because teachers um, within the policy, they can weight things differently. And so that's something we need to get tighter on so that there is an alignment. I remember when I was principal at Turner, I would get a call and, you know, my student um, is is getting uh, nearly meets on the CST at the time, but an A in the class. Why is that? You know, should it be opposite? Because there's a lot of other factors that go into a grade than maybe on this test. This test can't measure everything. Okay, I think there are some things that we can look at. And it might be a tool that parent, you know, because you get the thing in the mail and you say, oh, that's neat. And, but I don't know if it's useful to anybody because you know, I'm not sure you know it's how, what it's predicting or not predicting or indicating. But, you know, one of the things is like, you know, I was just reading an article somebody published about uh, saving for retirement. And they were saying, okay, it, in your 20s, this is how much you should save. In your 30s, this is how much you should save. In your 40s, right? And, and, and so if you are a, three or in a third grader and you, want, and you have an aspiration for your child to go to an Ivy League school, this is where they should be. And if they're not, now is the time to intervene, right? And if, they're, if they hit it in their middle school and they're, they're off path, you need, in other words, make well, it useful for people. Right, I and I know. don't know that it gets to that level, but as, oh, no. yeah. but the, the, when this test and these standards were looked at, colleges were involved in saying if students meet proficiency, get a three on the test, that serves as their entrance exam. Yeah, that's not until 11th grade, right? I'm saying third, right. middle but, school, but then, and so we'd want is them, consistent. We'd want them to be building at that proficiency level all the way through because once they're falling. It also speaks to how good the test is too, yep. right. like how well the test is written. And if we don't believe How it, it actually reflects someone's ability. Um, and this is probably a really ignorant question and I don't, I think the answer is no, but there's no funding attached to our scores. No. No. There, right. there uh, is something called um, differentiated intervention otherwise known as program improvement. So, so very poorly you get. Yeah, so, and, and you don't have to, it, well, because the, mo and this gets into the dashboard, which I'll come back and present on when it comes out, that's the accountability side of this, and it takes into account many other factors. It's a growth model, 
And so even when we're doing well, we want all kids to continue to grow. Um, and so if you're not growing, even small growth in, in these areas, you can go into program improvement, which first means you do some self-reflection and you put in some other programs. We work with our county. And then, you know, more and more um, support comes. We've been lucky. There's been two di uh, districts in our county that aren't in program improvement, and we are one of them. We haven't heard for this year because the accountability measures aren't out yet. Um, but this, these are also reflected in how our schools are rated. Right, so that, that. there's impact that. There's impact in terms of um, property value. Um, OK. I mean, I just like for, I mean, I'm not an educator. Like, I know you are. But um, I know that standard testing, I think, is a skill in and of itself. Like, I, uh, I'm i not a good standard. I don't do well. I never did. I always got straight A's. I have a kid who um, actually did really well on his standardized test, but his actual grade wasn't very good. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, and obviously, those are individual, unique situations. But um, And clearly, this is what we're being looked at. And obviously, it's it's what we what we need to do. Um, and, and I didn't know the piece around the college. Um, I mean, that sounds like it's relatively useful. Well, like, like Leslie said, I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not a perfect test, but you have the, you know, the state standards. And this is that state test that gives us a pretty good indication of, how, of curricular alignment and to the degree that we're covering those standards and students are getting it. Uh, that's why when Leslie is uh, given, Dr. Beats is given previous assessments, she talks about, and we've talked about it as a board, um, multiple multiple measures because okay. if you rely totally on this as, as uh, Peter Morgan said it, it doesn't always tell the whole story and so we like to take a look at we have our own you know reading assessments of the younger grades and you know benchmark assessments at grade levels so we try to do those as well to get to get the whole picture so it is it's an imperfect test uh, it, I think it's one of the most sophisticated standardized tests that I've seen in 32 years with that cognitive ramp you know the questions get harder Etc. So it's a decent predictor for us. Not perfect. Yeah, I don't mean but, you know. to be critical. Oh no, no, I don't. I don't see that. Just you know. Yeah. Yeah, I was actually my question was more of is everyone bought into it. When you say relevancy, is people are people all saying yeah we need to we need to get a improve our scores or is it just like ah it's another one of those tests and. Um. Right now, we're we're in a state of creating some healthy urgency yeah. around <laughs> the need. Um. Because there are areas where we're growing in, and it's frustrating when we, and, and you've been in our classrooms, and you've heard the level of uh, dialogue and analysis that kids are doing, and when we don't necessarily see a transfer, we say, what is going on? We know how hard our teachers are working. Um, I, just the last point on that, I think another benefit is that it prov it provides us um, Consistency is not the word I want, but that's the only thing that's coming to mind right now. If we can look at an item and say, this is what the state says is meeting standard 3.1, and that student's in my class, and then they move across town to your class, and you still know what that standard looks like, our instructional practices and what we ask kids to do are going to be more in alignment in terms of the uh, complexity of our instruction. Um, and so my last slide just are uh, more actions, those beginning actions that we're looking at, um, looking at testing environment. When we test, what's our room set up like? Can we chunk the test more to kind of combat some of that fatigue? Familiarizing ourselves with the tech tools on an ongoing basis so it's not just right before the test. Um, being present in classrooms and seeing what's happening and, and dropping those um, feedback notes so we can say, hey, we noticed you were doing this. This looks like, you know, you're practicing this particular skill or strategy. At this time, yes. The the computer, of yes. And um, that's what the, the teachers will tell us, you know, when you walk around and you watch kids take this and they're like, man, they get tired. It's, it's long and, and they're, you know, there's, it's technical. So we try to give them opportunities to do practice tests and, and play with it. But it's, it's challenging, especially in third grade. Yeah. Right. Ah. 
Right. Right. Is that perseverance? So it's yeah, it's like those that. other they're not content related skills, but how do you pace yourself? How do you take a break when you need to all of those kinds of things? And so that's things that this is new for us, even though it's our fourth time we've done it, we're learning more each time and saying, okay, we we need to perhaps pause the test and give kids breaks because now we know how much longer it can go for some students who are doing really well on the test. Longer those, um, those classroom reading programs that used to be adaptive tests, you know, they could, when the kids were reading, they'd be able to take quizzes. Or read naturally. The read, we do. Yeah. Thank we you, I was read. trying to think what it, yep, we use, because um, that used to be an adaptive type of test too. And obviously like in a 15 or 20 minute segment, but I mean, at least it was that same. We, we use that not with all students, but with some students. Uh, read naturally live. It's all computer. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And she gets to do this one more time. This time it's 12.3, um, the LCAP, the local priorities, and the self-assessment report. Okay, so this is part of our dashboard. It's our part of our accountability. Last year was the first year I had to bring this to you. Um, it is a self-assessment where we rate ourselves internally on uh, several of the priorities. So the state has eight priorities that um, we have to report on, and they uh, make up part of our LCAP strategic plan. And um, every year, we need to measure our progress on a local indicator that we design or we choose. And then we report to you our progress on that. And then um, we plug it into the dashboard. And so when the dashboard, and that's the 5 by 5 color grid, goes live in December, they are telling us it will be uh, up in December, um, our local priorities will um, be available for public view at that time. So um, we had to assess ourselves on priority one, which is appropriately assigned teachers, access to curriculum aligned materials, and safe and clean and functional school facilities. Priority two, implementation of academic state standards. Three, parent engagement. Six, school climate. And seven, access to broad courses of study. And so um, for each indicator, we do met, not met, um, or not met for two or more years. And it is a self-assessment. Um, we used our district curriculum council and went through a, an assessment that looks like this, where uh, we broke, you, you were there, we broke apart different chunks of this information and rated ourselves, and we definitely have some room to grow, but we did meet the standard in all areas. And so we'll use this information to continue to set goals in the work that we do both. Um, it's, it's not necessarily state uh, CASP data, but it will be things in terms of continuing to grow our instructional program, looking at policy alignment, and, and so forth. So that's my report. Very complex. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, any other comments or questions, or we'll move on. Okay, we're going to go on to 13, which is the not consent action items. 13.1 is consideration and approval of resolution number 18-19-21, authorizing an instructor to teach in departmentalized classes. Dr. Gill. Yes. So uh, we have a wonderful teacher at the high school, Benicia High School, uh, Samantha Sanchez, who teaches CTE dance. She's currently working on her credential. She does have enough units for us to continue to authorize her to teach physical education, uh, which the state does allow, CTC does allow, but the board has to pass this resolution in order for us to continue having her approve that. And uh, so that's, uh, we're bringing that uh, re resolution for your approval so we can, she can continue to teach physical education as well while she completes her credential. Is this her second year or her third year? This she started here in November of 2000, uh, last year, 2016, but there was a gap um, last year. Okay, thank you. Oops. Any other questions or comments? Do I have a motion? I move that we approve 
Resolution 18-19-21 for that allows Samantha Sanchez to teach physical education. Second. And it's a roll call vote. Right. President Perucci? Yes. Trustee Holguin? Yes. Trustee Wing? Yes. Trustee Monette? Yes. Trustee Morgan? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. I love Mr. Wing's tips, by the way. We let the minutes reflect us. <laughs> <laughs> okay, 13.2 is consideration and approval of the appointment of members to the Benicia Unified School District Citizens Bond Oversight Committee for the Measure S General Obligation Bond. Mr. Rahe? Yeah. Good evening. Um, tonight we have um, before you to approve three of our community members on our Citizens Bond Oversight Committee. It's required. Um, that we have this seven member uh, committee um, and those three members are um, Scar Scott Burford uh, from the parent community, uh, David Sells from the PTA PTG community and um, Todd Blatler from the community at large. Um, there are two other open positions at this time, one from a senior citizens organization as well as the, another one um, in the business organization. So we're going to continue our outreach and hopefully bring that back to you at a November school board meeting. So I have a question. Why we are pursuing um, different avenues to, to get people to continue to fill these seats. Can we continue to do work? Yes. yes. Are all three of these reappointments? They are, yes. Yeah, Scott Burford, this will be his third um, um, term, and that will be his uh, final one that he's allowed to do. And uh, this will be the second uh, for both David and Todd. Any other questions? Yeah, just to point out briefly what a terrific group of individuals that, that board has been. Mm -hmm. just wonderful community members and, and committed and engaged and they show up and they're prepared to participate. We've been very fortunate, so we're been. well served. Okay, with that said, do I have, if I have no more comments, can I call for a motion? I, I'm sorry, I have okay. one more question. Nope, go for it. For um, a representative of the business community, does their business have to be stationed in Benicia? So very good question. So to be a member on our Citizens Bond Oversight Committee, um, you must be 18 years old, at least 18 years old. You must reside within our school district boundaries. Um, you cannot be uh, em an employee of the district. Um, you cannot be um, an official um, um, representing the district in, in that type of capacity. You can't be a district vendor. Um, you can't be a district contractor. Um, you cannot be a district consultant. So you basically can't get paid by the district um, to be a member on this committee, um, and you cannot serve more than three consecutive terms. So if you're at least 18 years old, um, reside within the district, and you're not um, getting paid by the district, um, the um, business organization, um, they, there has to be some sort of affiliation with a business organization to represent that group that serves um, the Benicia community. So it is possible that the person who meets those other qualifications might have a business outside of Benicia, but still has connections and is considered uh, serving uh, the Benicia uh, community, representing um, those interests on the oversight committee. Okay, any other comments or questions? All right, with that said, can I call for a motion, please, to approve the appointment of the members to the Citizens Bond Oversight Committee as oh. presented? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion passes. And guess what? This meeting is adjourned. <laughs> <laughs>